I'm your host, Catherine Hunter Williams, along with my co host, Catherine Blake. Hello, everybody. And we welcome you all to Satora's Black History Corner Internet Program. Today we have a guest with us, Dinah Harrison. This is Miss Blake's sister. Hello. Baby sister, big sister. Baby, Baby sister. sister. Baby sister. Baby. All right. She's on the program with us today, and I'm so glad to have her here with us. Amen. I told her I may just ask her a little question and just throw me a quick little answer because she's, she's the public, and I want to know how the public kind of feel about us <laughs> and our stories. All right. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> We hope you have uh, enjoyed the song you heard at the beginning of our program, Be Proud to Be Black, by Flint, Flint's own rapper T.P., The Product. As always, we like to invite you to call in with any questions or comments at 810-208-1854. We not only tell our story about past great heroes and sheroes, but also about those living in present day. Amen. And as today, our stories, we're going to tell you our story about um, Shirley Lynn, Lynn Ifield, who is mm -hmm. uh, Gwen Ifield's cousin. Ms. Ms. Blake is going to tell you the story about them, and I'm going to tell you the story about something else, the first and second major league baseball players, and it's going to be a big surprise. Amen. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Are you ready, Ms. Blake? Yes. All right. All right, everybody. Uh, I, I, I hope everybody knows about Gwen Eiffel. She is a prominent person in, in, uh, in the black community. Just to let you know that she was born September 29th in 1955. She is an American journalist. Now, don't say African-American. It says an American. But it journalist. used to say African-American. But see, now they just removed mm -hmm. the African in front of it. But we keep it alive. Right. It's American-African. And that's a beautiful picture of her also, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. if you just a, say American, you could be black, white, well, Latino, yeah. or whatever. <laughs> so, okay, now we're doing it. American-African. All right. They did remove it. And you know, when we was doing this program, they removed it since we've been doing that. Right, right, right. right. She's a television newscaster and an author. She is the managing editor and moderator of Washington Week and a senior correspondent for PBS NewsHour. Now, I'm pretty sure everybody knows about PBS, uh, both on which airs on PBS. She is a political analyst and moderated the 2004 and 2008 vice president debates. She is the author of a book called The Breakthrough, 
on politics and race in the age of Obama. Don't she sometimes be on the, uh, uh, I think it's the Washington Post, did you say her? Washington Post. Washington Week. Post, uh, the New York Times and NBC. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Uh -huh. She out there. Yes, she is. She was born in New York City. She's the fifth child of the African Methodist Episcopal AME minister Oliver Yusrael Eiffel Sr., a Panamanian and Barbadian, uh, Barbadian descent who migrated to Panama, and Eleanor I feel as her mother, who was from Barbados. So that's what that I feel, because uh -huh. that's not a normal American name. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. Because uh -huh. uh -huh. when she sent it, when you sent it to me, I said, I feel. I feel. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's I feel? I feel. I feel. I feel. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That's what they said on television. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm saying I feel because it's I, I'm hearing it phonetically. I F I L L. Okay. Okay. Her father's ministry required the family to live in several cities throughout New England. I didn't know she was of in around in that New England part. Mm -hmm. And the Eastern Seaboard during her youth and in her childhood. Did she grow up here? Uh huh. Okay. Eiffel lived in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts church parsonages and in federally subsidized housing in Buffalo and in New York City. She graduated in 1977 with a Bachelor in the Arts and in Communications from Simmons College in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, we know no, Boston, Boston just had yeah, that, that incident. That bombing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And we'd like to send our condolences to all the family. Yes, we would. And to tell them, to if, if, if they Christians, to speak Psalms 121, which look to the hills from which come your help. Yes, and my he help coming from the Lord. You. Amen. Amen. And while she was at Bo Simons College, she interned at the Boston Herald American and was hired after graduation by editors, and they were deeply embarrassed by an incident during her internship in which a co-worker left her a note for her that read, the N-word, go home. Oh. Wow. Mm-hmm. So that that she's uh, dealt with a lot of that discrimination. Yeah, but she went on. I know she yeah, has. She has. But she went on and she worked at the Baltimore Evening Sun, the Washington Post, like you said, mm -hmm. and the New York Times. All right, on February seventh, she was made an honorary member of the Delta Sigma Theta. We know that's a, a highly uh, beautiful group of uh, sororities that was in the, the only black group that was in the suffrage march, which this is the hundredth year of that suffrage march uh, for the women to win the right to vote, which okay. is going to bring me into her cousin. And her cousin, who is Cheryl Lynn Eiffel, Cheryl Lynn Eiffel, Sherry Lynn Eiffel? Sherry Lynn. Oh, he gonna get it. Uh, <laughs> Sherry Lynn Eiffel. Okay. All right, John. When we get to talking about voting, I wanted to. Uh, oh. There she is. Okay. Professor Sherry Lynn Eiffel is nationally recognized as an advocate in the areas of civil rights, voting rights, judicial diversity, and judicial decision making. She teaches civil procedure, legal writing, and a seminar on reparations. Did you hear me? I hear you. Reconciliation and restorative justice. Professor Eiffel has also taught cost constitutional law, environmental justice, complex litigations, as well as seminar on voting rights, equal protection, and judicial decision making. Professor Eiffel also co-founded with Professor Michael Minard the reentry of ex offenders clinic where they can also learn their legal rights on um, voting and whatever they might need to enter into society. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the challenge for 2008 and beyond is this is a little excerpt from her book right here that I wanted to mention. Uh, she said, The challenge for 2008 and beyond is for us to embrace the hope 
represented by the widespread acceptance of public figures like President Barack Obama and Colin Powell, while continuing the hard work of sorting through the lingering effects and reality of white supremacy in our society, which is really something uh, to talk about. Uh, to, just to give you a little something here, she is the seventh president and uh, director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Uh, Ms. Eiffel is a longtime member of the Legal Defense uh, Educational Family. After graduating from law school, um, Eiffel f first served as a fellow with the American Civil Liberties Union. We know about the ACLU. And uh, uh, for then, uh, for five years, and she assisted the Council for the Legal Defense Education Fund in New York office, where she litigated voting right cases. And, and um, there's so much about voting rights. I did send her a little note to ask her if there's something that she's working on now that we might could uh, introduce into our community about voting rights, even though Michigan is pretty good as far as felons voting again getting their voting rights, and we know about in the southern states that uh, felons do not have the right to vote. They have lost that. But I was just interested, and I'm going to try to get her book also. And the name of her book is On the Courthouse Lawn, Confronting the Legacy of Lynching in the 21st Century. Right. It explores the continuing effects of the last two recorded lynchings in Maryland. Right, right, right. On the Courthouse Lawn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that was just a little something I wanted to give you about Miss both Eiffels. Mrs. Uh, Sherry Lynn Eiffel is the baby cousin of Gwen Eiffel. And these two ladies are on the move, and they are definitely working it out for our people. And, for, and you know, it's not just for black people. It's They're for women. There, period. Yep. Yeah, for yeah, all, all the races. Did you get the name of uh, uh, Gwen Eiffel's book? Oh, uh, you know, did I? I don't think I did. Okay. Uh, yes, I did. Politics and race in the age of Obama. Yeah, the breakthrough. The breakthrough. Politics and the yeah. age of age of. I Obama. definitely want. I'm going to get that book also. And there are several things. Look up Gwen Eiffel. Uh, there's a lot of information on her and her cousin Sherry Lynn Eiffel. These are both important women of today that are really working. Uh, for the betterment and the uplifting. And actually the betterment of all of us. All people. Not right. just just for black women. I mean, they have made their mark already. Right. Uh, black women. <laughs> yes, they and have. And they're moving on and they're doing what they do. And also, they're, they're, it's whatever they're doing is for just for women, for, mm -hmm. period. Not just for us, but women and other minorities. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what the NAACP is there for. It's not just for African Americans. Uh, it's for all. All, all the rights for all people. Oh, NAAC is not just for black people no, anymore? No, mm -mm, no. Mm -mm. I did not know that one. Oh, well, that's that's what it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah you're still active in it, right? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to get a membership. I'll get it through you. Okay, okay. I'm chair of WIN. WIN is W-I-N, Women in NAACP. Okay. Just remind me. I sure will. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake, <laughs> for that wonderful information about Gwen and Sherry Lynn Eiffel. Just a quick little something on them. Two, two women on the move. Though. Two women on the move. Yeah, on the move. nothing wrong with that. All right, let's get to, to what I was talking to you earlier about, uh, the first and second major league baseball players that a lot of people don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have done a lot about number 42, which is uh, mm. Jackie Robinson. It's, it's been movies, out, books, all kind of stuff, but he was not the first. Wow. Okay. And I want to just start it off. Who was the first American African to play Major League Baseball? I thought it was Jackie Robinson, didn't you? Yes, I did. Nope, number it was 42. not. Yeah, did you go see the movie? No, I didn't see it, but I did heard you? it. We're gone. Good. Okay. Uh, well, George was telling me it's very well worth going to check oh, out. Oh, okay. But I said, well, George, they done made a lot of movies, and they always be yeah. built up. But I thought I he was the first, though. No, he was not the first. It's going to be very interesting. That Internet is something those people yes. that they have doing the research to mm -hmm. find out different yes. things. I'm glad they do it because, you know, for black people, 
there wasn't much history written down. Yeah, and you don't have to go to the books. You know, I mean, sometimes I have to go a little in-depth research that I can't find on the Internet. Mm -hmm. But most of the time I can find information I need mm -hmm. just by typing in the person's name and find it. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to have to go to the library and, and other places to get books to mm -hmm. research just one person. I'm kind of curious, mm -hmm. who was the first? Okay, I'm back to it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it was not Jackie Robinson in 1947, oh not Moses Fleetwood Walker in 1884, but William, 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 William John. There Thank is. you. Oh, there he is. But William Edward White in 1879. Wow. wow. The regular Providence, he played with the reg regular Providence Gray's first baseman. Mm. Joe Stewart was injured and unable to play against the visiting Cleveland Blues on June 21, 1879. Mm. White, a student baseball player at Brown University, who was the son of a Georgia slave owner, so he was a slave, y'all, and a black woman, and he was also his father's house servant. So his father was sending him to school. Mm. He was at the University of Brown, Brown University. Back when now? 1879, his father was sending him to school. So nice slavery, looking man. Slavery was over, but he was still his father's up uh, before. Because, mm -hmm. well, slavery, 1865. Right, so, 1865, yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, 1863. Yeah, 18, yeah. whatever. Yeah. It was, what, 15 years, 1879? Yeah. Wow. But it's, he was going to uh, uh, Brown University. Okay. Who was the son of a Georgia slave owner. So evidently he was not a slave at that time. Mm -hmm. He was, a, 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 let's just say, son of a, a Georgia slave owner and a black woman. And he was his father's house servant. Mm -hmm. So he was still working for his father. Oh, yeah. I got it now. Yeah. He wasn't a slave, but he was still his father's house servant. Right. And he was going to school during that time. He was born of a slave mother. No, they were not slaves. This is, is 1879. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Had to have been born of a slave mother because this is 1879. He must have. Been, he was in Brown University. He had to have been 18, 19 or something. Yeah. Right. So say 20 years out of enslavement. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. But he was born a slave. His mother was a slave, but he was still his father's house servant. Mm -hmm. Okay. He played in his place with so little fanfare. That his distinction as American African went unnoted until 2004. So he was very light skinned. Yeah, well, you can see from his yeah. picture. Yeah, yes. But you also, you can see, no, he didn't pass for white. You can also see his uh, features are also. Uh, mm -hmm. They uh, say he went almost unnoticed. He went unnoticed because they didn't, wasn't nothing said about it. Oh, okay. okay. Until 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Providence Morning Star raved about White's major league de debut and the support from his Brown University teammates. Ah. So it was, but it was little fanfare about it. Uh -huh. It ain't okay. like Jackie Robinson mm -hmm. or all that, but no. Mm -hmm. It was little fanfare, but there was some. Mm -hmm. The varsity boys lustily cheered their favorite at times. And how would delight when he got a safe hit in the ninth inning, mm -hmm. as they also did his magnificent, magnificent steals of seconds, of second base. Mm -hmm. I used to love playing some baseball. <laughs> Me too. And stealing bases. Oh, yeah. yeah. In that and the fifth inning, though he returned to play for Brown University in 1880, White never played another big league game. Oh. So he only did that one. Oh. All right, he was the first. Now we're going to go to the second one. Mm -hmm. And hit the first one was, as we said, William Edward White. William Edward 1879, White. 1879, June 21st. He played against the visiting Cleveland Blues, and he was a teammate of the Providence Grays. He was their first baseman. Okay. Now, let's move on to the second one. William Edward White. Uh, I'm sorry, not William Ever White. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Moses. There you go with his handsome self. Moses Fleetwood Walker. Walker. He was number two. Fleetwood. Where did you get that name from? Fleetwood. Didn't they have a Cadillac, Cadillac name after yeah. Fleetwood? But that was way Cadillac. after. <laughs> <laughs> Back then. <Cadillac. laughs> but he's a handsome man. 
And when I first went to try to uh, find any information out about him, I couldn't get a picture of anything. Mm -hmm. So that, that, you know, I mean, just look at the picture that they found from an old newspaper with William Edward White. Mm -hmm. That's where it looks on an old newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, I can, uh, um, with my computer, I can make it black and white. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But see the yellowing of the paper? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I did find that information. Number two, Moses Fleetwood, Fleet Walker. And also, he had a brother, but we'll talk about him later. He was born October 7, 1856, in Mount Pleasant, Ohio. And he was an American-African baseball player, inventor, and author. He is credited with being the first American-African to play Major League Baseball. But as y'all see, found out late, uh, that it was not him. He was not the first. It was William Edward White. Mm -hmm. Actually, he was the second. Okay, not and not Jackie Robinson. Not Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson came 60 years later. Walker is the one who, though, <clears throat> I'm getting ahead of myself. Walker played one season as the catcher of the Toledo Blue Stockings, a club in the American Association. He then played in the minor leagues until 1889, when professional baseball erected the color barrier. This is who it started with, him. Mm -hmm. Uh, that stood for nearly 60 years until Jackie Robinson came. Wow. After leaving baseball, Walker became a businessman and advocate of black nationalism. This brother here, mm. he went through some different things. He, um, he uh, said he was an inventor. He also, John, there's a picture of him, uh, the second one of him when he was in the collegiate <coughs> baseball. Right there. Yeah, thank you. He is uh, he's on the front row, third from the right. You can see him right there. He's uh, third from the right, right there in the front. He was recruited by the University of Michigan and played varsity what? baseball. University of Michigan. Michigan. Yeah, uh, thank you. I was going to get <laughs> This was his collegiate baseball. Okay. He was recruited by the University of Michigan, that's in Ann Arbor, and played varsity baseball for Michigan in 1882. Wow. That's why it's Ann Arbor. So you don't want him. Flynn ain't been here that long. Right. On March 4th, 1882, the University of Michigan student newspaper, The Chronicle, reported M.F. Walker, uh, which is uh, Moses Fleet Walker, mm -hmm. of the class of 1983 at Oberlin, arrived in town last week. It could have been 19. must be 1883. I'm sorry, 1883. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I, I, well, I'm not in the 1900s anymore. We are in the 21st century. Right. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Uh, anyway, he arrived in town last week and intends to enter the university. Mr. Walker caught for the Oberlin, Oberlin baseball team and last year corresponded with the managers of the Bostons with a view to traveling with the latter nine during the summer, but at length concluded not to do so. Packard and Walker will form the battery for a night for 1883 nines this spring. Now I'm gonna say this too. He had a brother named um, Weldy. Weldy. Hmm. There he is, Weldy Walker. Thank you, John. His name was Weldy Walker. They called him Weldy. Mm -hmm. Now those are the. Uh, that's the second. Uh, Moses Fleetwood Walker was the second. But his brother also played for the same league. Did he? Yeah. Oh. His brother, Welday Walker, later joined him on the team playing in six games. The Walker brothers are the first known American Africans to play baseball in the major league. No, they're not. As I showed you and told you the history, uh, the, our story of William Edward White, he was the first. Mm -hmm. Then uh, Fleetwood, Moses Fleetwood, or Fleet, they call him Fleet for short, Walker, was the second. And his brother, Will Day Walker, was the, the third. third. Jackie Robinson was number four, y'all. <laughs> Did you hear now that? That's a, now, get out that bubble. <laughs> get out that bubble. bubble. Because I know a lot of y'all are out there in that bubble because you don't know your history. Mm -hmm. Walker struggled at first with the bat, but was, wet, was well regarded for having a rocket of an arm. In 1884, he batted .264 which was well above the league's average. Wow. A testament to him of how good Walker was. 
His backup was a player named Deacon McGuire, who would go on to a 26-year career catching 600, 1,600 games. Walker's teammate and star pitcher, Tony Maloney, Mulaney, <laughs> sorry, Tony Mulaney, I don't want to mess up nobody's name, <laughs> Mulane, Tony Mulane. Stady Walker was the best catcher I ever worked with, mm -hmm. but I disliked a Negro. And whenever I had to pitch to him, I used to pitch anything I wanted without looking at his signals. Mulane's view hurted the team, as there were a number of pass balls and several injuries suffered by Walker, including a broken rib. Oh. There were games where Walker was so hurt he could not, he could not, could only play out in outfield. Uh, mm. He returned to the minors. Walker suffered a second-ending injury in July, and. And Toledo folded at the end of the year. Walker returned to the minor leagues in 1885 and played in the Western League for Cleveland, which folded in June. He then played for the Waterbury for Waterbury in the Eastern League through 1886. But I want to get down here to the color line drawn because we're going mm -hmm. over. Well, we started late though. In the off season, the International League modified its ban on black players. And as we had said earlier, that there was no other black players for 60 years until Jackie mm -hmm. Robinson. That's had. in the major leagues. Baseball. Yeah, the major leagues, because there was a Negro League. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but th this is the major league. But the reason they got the Negro League is because well, they, they couldn't them. play. Yeah. Thank you. And those were some bad boys. Yes, maybe, they were. Yeah, maybe we'll do oh, something. Yeah. yeah, we have done something on yeah. them. Yeah, Satchel we have. Page. Yeah, we yeah. have. We have done our story on them. Uh, okay, um, modified his ban on black players, and Walker signed with the Syracuse, New York, franchise for 1888. In September 1888, Walker had his second incident with Anson. Now, Anson, they call him Mr. Anson. Uh, uh, I need to go back a little bit. Uh, only, only days after the game, this is up here when they was playing against the um, he moved to the International League Newark Little Giants. And this is where Mr. Anson came in, or they call him Big Anson. Only days after the game was reported in the schedule in the Newark Sunday call that Stovey was expected to pitch in the Chicago game. It was announced on the game, on the ground, I'm sorry, i.e. at the baseball park, that he was a sulky, but it was... It has since been given out that Anson object to colored man playing, to mm. a colored man playing. If this be true, the crowd had known it. Mr. Anson would have received hisses instead of the applause that was given him when he first stepped on to the bat. He was a baseball player, so. Mm -hmm. On the morning of that same International League, owners had voted 6-4 to four to exclude American African players from future con uh, oh, tracks. Wow. So that's I was going back here to to Anson, uh, where he was playing in a uh, in Chicago, so Syracuse was playing in that for an exhibition game. Mm -hmm. Anson refused to start the game when he saw Walker's name on the scorecard wow. as catch as catcher. Big Anson at once refused to play the game with Walker behind the bat on account of the star's catcher's color. The Syracuse Her Herald said Syracuse relented, and someone else did the catching. Walker remained in Syracuse until the team released him in July 1889. Wow, that was pretty stepping up. Who? Uh, yeah, for them to keep him on there, Walk, keep Walker on there. Yeah, they kept him on there. Yeah. But he, uh, they, yeah, they didn't release him. Well, it wasn't but a year later, mm -hmm. July 1889. This happened in 88. Mm -hmm. So it was just a year later. Now I want to also tell you a little bit of stuff about his post base life, baseball okay. life, mm -hmm. where he was at a had got attacked by a group of white men in Syracuse, New oh, York. Well, you know that was going to happen. This is in April, like 1891. This is <laughs> okay. After, okay. <laughs> he stabbed and killed a man named Patrick Murray during the attack. Walker did? Mm -hmm. The Sporting Life reported that Walker drew a knife and made a stroke. At it, uh, made a uh, uh, y'all can't see me, but he made a stroke at his assailant. The knife entered Murray's, Murray's groan, inflicting a fatal wound. In his groan? Yep. Mm. What, what was he down on the floor, I wonder? 
You could be standing up. The groin is right there, ain't it? That stomach area. Is that the groin? Okay. Or down lower? Down lower. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Murray's friend started after Walker with shots. Kill him, kill him. He escaped but oh, was captured wow. by the police and was locked up. Walker was charged with second degree murder and claimed self defense. He was acquitted of all charges on June 3rd, 1891. He was acquitted? He was acquitted. All right. Added to the weight of the verdict was that Walker was acquitted by an all-white white jury. jury. That's what I said. He was acquitted back in those days? The Gle Cleveland Gazette reported when the verdict was announced, the courthouse was thronged with spe spectators who received it with a tremendous roar of cheers. Walker is the hero what? of the hour. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. He was also very heavy in politics. He wrote a book. Though. This book is deep he wrote. Walker became a supporter of black nationalism. He was also an inventor, but let me get that to what he invented. Uh, uh, he invented, let me see, where was it? Okay, Walker applied for several patents on several inventions for moving picture equipment and even published a weekly newspaper also in 1891. Walker received patents for an exploding artillery shell. Wow. Yeah. Artillery shell, that was a... Is that a, a gun? A bullet? That's, I mean, a, a bullet? that's a bomb, ain't it? Could be a bomb, Exploded. yeah. We need John so we could talk to him because he could tell us what this was. It had to be or a bomb. Or is. An exploding, exploding artillery, artillery shell. shell. That means it's a it's big a bomb. bullet, bullet then. Yeah. It had to be a bomb. He wrote a book. Uh, okay, Walker became a supporter of black nationalism and came to believe that racial integration would fail in the United States. This is an 18... Hmm. In 1908, he published a 47-page pamphlet titled Our Home Colony, a treatise on the past, present, and future of the Negro race in America. In that pamphlet, listen to this recommendation, in that pamphlet he recommended that American Africans immigrate to Africa. Oh, please. The only, back in those days, yeah. he done got hit in the head and everything. You go see Jackie Robinson, see how they did it. <laughs> and this was back before that. My goodness. The only practical and permanent solution of the present and future. Now, this is in the 1800s, y'all. Okay, now, don't get it twisted. <laughs> okay. The only practical and permanent solution of the present and future race troubles in the United States is the entire separation by immigration of the Negro from America. He warned, the Negro race will be a menace and the source of discontent as long as it remained in large numbers in the United States. The time is growing very near when the whites of the United States must either settle this problem by deportation, which came along later with, Mar later with Marcus, Marcus Garvey, Garvey, back to Africa movement, and then with uh, President Monroe, uh, so it was, they were trying to do what he yeah, said. Yeah. <laughs> or else be willing to accept a ring of terror such as the world has never seen in a civilized country. That's his recommendation. In his 47-page pamphlet titled Our Home Colony, a treatise on the past, present, and future of the Negro race in America. All right. Moses Fleetwood Walker joined the realm of his beloved ancestors on May 11th, 1924, in Cleveland, Ohio. Mm. And he is buried at Union Cemetery in Student Benville, Ohio. And that's the story. Of, that's our story of Moses Fleetwood Walker, his brother Wilder Walker, who were the second and third <laughs> baseball major league players, and the first, of course, was William Edward White. I'm going to look them up in my uh, my baseball book. Okay. And see what they say about them in there. Tell me if they're in your baseball yeah, book. Yeah, because that's the they Negro might baseball. Be might they not. might not be in there. They might be in there. They and they might. might. You know, if they if you got a good one and it's that's following right. the history of baseball. Mm -hmm. But then this was, uh, this just popped. With mm -hmm. this one here, and I said, "Ooh, okay." Absolutely. So I did. I said, "Okay, I'm just want to go, just going to tell the mm -hmm. whole story about it." Um, all right, that's our stories. Our stories. Thank you, Lord, for it. Past uh, and present. Uh, sure, Sherry Lynn, I feel. And Gwen, I feel. Gwen, I feel. Uh, okay. William Edward Burton Hart. Is that his name? Did I say his name right? William Edward White. White. 
Moses Fleetwood Walker. Fleetwood and, and Walday Walker. Day Walker. Mm -hmm. All right, now I hope y'all got that right. Because see, if you don't know your history, you won't know this stuff. Mm -hmm. You will just think and accept whatever they give you. That's why it's good to know, know your, your history, history so you can understand what's happening today and move on toward the future. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line of knowing your story. Okay? Knowing your story. All right. All right. We'd like to thank you. You got to turn back around here. <laughs> Diana Harrison for being on our program. Diana, you, thank you. I'm sorry, Diana. Mm -hmm. You got any, and I know this. You got any <laughs> comments or want to, got anything you want to say? Very good information. Okay, thank you. <laughs> our story is about our American African heritage and culture. Sadora's so Black History Corner internet program comes to you via satellite at uh, Satoris Black History Corner YouTube. John, is this? Yeah. Is it a slash in there? Okay, it's at Satoris Black History Corner YouTube. Okay. Or, okay, that's it. You can watch our program every second and fourth Monday of the month starting at 3.30 p.m. Also, be sure to watch what's going on with political pundit Dr. George Moss every Monday at 2 p.m. That's at Satoris Black History Corner YouTube. Is that one word, John? Yeah, yeah I get it. one word? Just said Torres Black History Corner. That's just type it like that. Okay, because you know how you type it in, you space it and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the meantime, while you're waiting for our next program, keep on keeping on with us, along with the sounds of TPCD single, Be Proud to Be Black. And if you would like to purchase the CD single, you can contact TP at... 810-962-3258, 810-962-3258. Finally, as always, I'd like to say asante to all of you who have watched our program today. And if you like what you have seen and heard, please pass it on to others. May God bless you and keep you safe and in his perfect hotel, which means peace. See you later, everybody. Bye-bye. I'm not